Good morning, and welcome to Fondren Presbyterian Church. Uh, please take the friendship pad that is on the middle aisle on your pew and record your presence here. If you're a visitor, please give us your contact information so that we can be in touch with you. We welcome you all. Please read the announcements in your bulletin. Uh, we have a summary in the bulletin of all the activities and the ministries here at Fondren, uh, and we invite you to be involved in any of those in which you're interested. Please make note that the church office will be closed tomorrow, November the 13th, for Veterans Day holiday and then we'll reopen on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Stewardship season continues here at Fondren. Pledge cards were mailed to each of you several weeks ago, and blank cards are available on the table in the narthex or in the pews this morning. We ask that you prayerfully consider how you might contribute financially to the work and ministries of the church in 2024. And please return your pledge card to the finance office if you have not done so already. This week we will have another special Wednesdays Together program. The program on Wednesday, November the 15th will feature guest speaker Langston Moore from the Society of St. Andrew, an organization that gleans leftover food from farms and gets it into the hands of those across the state who are feeding the hungry. A chili bar supper will be served at 6 and the program will begin at 6.45. Please let us know if you plan to come to the supper so that we can make sure that we have enough food. And you can sign, there's a sign up sheet in the narthex, or you can contact the church office on Tuesday and let Bobby know. Our interim pastor, Joel Alves, is out of town this week, and in his absence, we are excited to have the Reverend Dr. Jason Coker with us today. Dr. Coker is the president of Together for Hope a rural development coalition that fights persistent rural poverty in America. Some of us were fortunate enough to hear Dr. Coker's presentation this past Wednesday night and were enthralled and encouraged to hear about the outstanding work that Together for Hope is doing right here in our own state. Welcome to Fondren, Dr. Coker. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. Coker's family who are with us this morning. We are delighted to have you here. And now let us join our hearts together and worship God. <clears throat> Rejoice and be glad, for God is our salvation. Rejoice and be glad, for God is great. 
Please stand and join me singing hymn 363, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
rejoice and be glad, for God is mighty to save and comes to you in peace to forgive, restore, and strengthen you eternally in Christ. Jesus Christ, we are our Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, be with you all.
May the oil in our lamps never run dry so that we can see your way and follow. Amen. Our readings this morning come from the prophet Amos and the Gospel of Matthew. This is Amos 5, 12 through, uh, 18 through 24. Doomed to those who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Or sought refuge in a house, rested a hand against the wall, and was bitten by a snake. Isn't the day of the Lord darkness, not light? All dark with no brightness in it. I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your entirely burned offerings and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten young bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now five were wise, and the other five were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps, but didn't bring oil for them. But the wise ones took their lamps and also brought containers of oil. When the groom was late in coming, they all became drowsy and went to sleep. But at midnight, there was a cry. Look, the groom, come out and meet him. Then all of those bridesmaids got up, got up and prepared their lamps. But the foolish bridemaids said to the wise ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps have gone out. But the wise bridesmaids replied, No, because if we share with you, there won't be enough for our lamps and yours. We have a better idea. You go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the groom came. Those who were ready went with him into the wedding. Then the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't even know you. Therefore, keep alert, because you don't know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. On July 10th, 1927, when First Presbyterian Church in Jackson formed a committee to plan a mission church in a neighborhood in the northern part of the city, they probably never envisioned a Sunday in the distant future when what would become Fondren Presbyterian Church 
would have an ordained Baptist minister <laughs> preaching a sermon about the second coming of Christ. But alas, here we are. So, but don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Uh, it shouldn't be as scary as it sounds. Maybe. It is a true honor to worship with you today uh, and even spend some time with you on Wednesday uh, in what truly is a beacon of light in the city of Jackson you are. So thank you for your presence and witness for nearly a century right here in Jackson. Thank you for your presence and witness. You've had the extra oil in your lamps for a long time. Right here. And I'm truly grateful for your faithfulness in the good news of our faith right here in Jackson. You've told the truth when the truth wasn't cool. In fact, when the truth was denied and reviled by some so-called Christians, especially during the civil rights era. And here we are again in that, in a, an inflection point as Christians, as people of goodwill and good faith, as people who try to do what, what's right when it seems like there are so many forces, indeed so many other so-called Christians, bent on a race to the bottom, and when there they start digging through the floor to see what's below the bottom. Apocalyptic texts. Apocalyptic texts from the New Testament, uh, like the lect lectionary passage for today, uh, may be just the text we need to turn to right now. Because it does feel like we are in an apocalyptic moment. There's a great revelation happening right now that is unmistakable and, I think, irrevocable. The world as we know it is coming to an end. And there will be a new beginning. The biggest question for us is how much will we be a part of that new beginning? Will we be the architects or will we be the residents? Will we be the builders or will we will be the inhabitants? There's a new world being designed right now, and there is a great disagreement about what the blueprints should look like. Our ancient and sometimes archaic scriptures, uh, they can be great places to find the ink for our pens as we begin the new writing for the next generation. And what do we find in the Gospel of Matthew and the old prophet Amos that can give us a vision for the church and our society today, especially now, as we're nearing the end of the Christian calendar and start moving toward the year of Advent, the newness, only three weeks away. Are you ready for Advent? <laughs> this parable that starts in Matthew 25, it seems odd, like so many parables in the New Testament. But the real meaning of these ten bridesmaids, it's fairly, fairly easy, fairly simple, and most scholars agree, which is peculiar since we usually don't agree on anything. But the point of the parable is so simple, it's almost too obvious. Jesus, Jesus is running late. That's it. That is the entire parable. Jesus is running late. The bridegroom definitely represents Jesus here, who apparently always runs late. And every one of the bridesmaids, just hold on to this, every one of the bridesmaids brought lanterns and fell asleep waiting on him. Do you have somebody in your life like that? He was so late, apparently, that every one of them ran out of oil in their lamps. It's interesting which different translations say. 
Uh, all of them brought lamps. All their lamps ran out. Half of them knew the bridegroom well enough to bring extra oil. That's how late Jesus was. So all of you who run late or are well known for it, and I took my glasses off so I can't see your face, I guess you're the most Christ-like among us. And to be clear, if I'm 15 minutes early, I feel like I'm late. So maybe I'm the least Christ-like in my family. But that's the whole parable. Jesus is running late. But that's important for Matthew's community, the community to which he wrote this gospel. The whole Jesus movement started as this apocalyptic movement. And one of the earliest writings in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, was written to address the issue of Jesus' delayed return. This is a big problem. Jesus said he would come back and he had not. So what are they supposed to do? As Jesus' return, technically called the parousia by Bible nerds, as Jesus' return was delayed, the followers of Jesus started to conceptualize his return in more, in more of a distant future. And this time between already and not yet, this liminal time, created a problem for the delayed promise of the kingdom of God, or God's reign. It was a, such a serious problem that nearly all of the New Testament writers deal with it. What are we supposed to do in the meantime? Seems like Jesus is running very, very late. And what are we supposed to do? Matthew tells us. Stay ready. Bring some extra oil. Most scholars of Matthew demonstrate the extra oil that the wise bridesmaids bring. They think that represents good works. And this seems right based on the rest of Matthew chapter 25. And not only that, but that's based on the rest of all of the Gospel of Matthew. You'd be hard-pressed to find a Pauline version of one is saved by faith alone and not by works of the law. You'd be hard-pressed to find that in the Gospel of Matthew. Over and over again, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew talks, says that good works, works matter. Over and over again. And then the grand finale of all the parables in Matthew that one we love in Matthew 25. You're, you're a Matthew 25 church, aren't you? Yeah. Um, that part, all the nations on earth are going to be judged by their, their works. You know that as a Matthew 25 church. At the end of days, in the end of days, when Jesus finally returns, all the nations will be gathered together for judgment, and Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats, and he tells the sheep, because you believed in me, you'll have eternal life. Where's my Bible, people? That is not what it says, is it? He didn't say that at all. He said, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was sick, you came to the hospital. And they were all bewildered. And they said, when did we do this? And he responded, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. The Gospel of Matthew repeats this theme throughout his Gospel. Even the great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching there in chapter 7 of Matthew. And he says, not all those who call out, Lord, Lord, will be saved. And what did, this, what did the foolish bridesmaids say when they came to the Lord, Lord? And he says, I don't know you. In other words, for Matthew, just saying you believe isn't enough. You better do something. 
that seems to be this extra oil. What are we supposed to do while we wait on this very, very late Jesus? We should never grow weary in doing good. No matter how late Jesus is, no matter how far away the kingdom of God feels, no matter who's the governor of Mississippi, no matter who's the president of the United States, no matter how good or bad policies of the day are, we as those who are called Christians should always have oil in our lamps because sometimes the world can be very, very dark. Sometimes it feels like we are about as far away from God's reign as we've ever been. In my work with Together with Hope, our service area is defined by something called persistent rural poverty. That means that 20% of a rural county's population has lived below the federal poverty line for the last 30 consecutive years or more. Generation. There are 338 counties of persistent rural poverty in the United States of America. And there are over 200 more counties of persistent childhood poverty. That is a lot of poverty. In our home state, 46 of our 82 counties are in persistent rural poverty. There are seven additional counties of persistent metro poverty, making our grand total in Mississippi 53 of our 82 states are in persistent poverty. That's 65% of our state. So when someone says that our economy in Mississippi is strong, that may not be a total lie, but it does beg the question, for whom is the economy strong? For whom? Because it seems like if it is strong, it's strong for far too few people. Medicaid expansion. It's one thing that uh, we're working on, um, advocating for that, affordable health care for all. That's one piece of our advocacy that we're working on in several non-expansion states, so Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. We're working on this because we feel like Jesus would want all of God's children, all those created in God's image, to have access to affordable health care. We've combed the Bible for instances where Jesus refuses to heal the sick. We haven't been able to find any of those passages yet. And it seems to us that Jesus' whole ministry was a ministry defined by healing the sick and not refusing to. So we fight for affordable health care for all. And we've been called some pretty good names for that. But the one we like most of all is Christians. And all that to say, that our state desperately needs people of faith to have some extra oil. It reminds me of a story a long time ago uh, when I was a pastor in Connecticut. We brought a group of about 20 people from our church uh, down to my hometown, Shaw, Mississippi. Uh, Shaw is right in the middle of the Mississippi Delta. I don't know how many of you are familiar with where Shaw is. It's basically you drive to the middle of the Delta, and that's about where you are. Uh, we asked the mayor of that town, who was, an who was my elementary school teacher uh, when I was a kid, uh, we asked him, like, how can we help the town? 
And she said, you know, could you paint the back of the library, the old library, because the paint had been peeling off the wall for decades, right? And the back, of the back door had been tagged with some spray paint. So we got some scaffolding, we bought some paint, and we got to work on this, uh, this, this back of his library. And this guy, who I'd known all my life, walked up to us, and he goes, what are y'all doing? I said, well, the mayor asked us to paint the back of the library, so we're going to paint the back of the library. And he got this, like, scowl on his face. And he said, as soon as you do that, these kids, they're just going to vandalize it as soon as you're gone. And I thought, like, we spent a lot of money to fly down here from Connecticut <laughs> to be here to do this, and that's what you're going to say? I mean, I was getting a little amped up, right? So I looked at him and I said, we have more money than they do. We have more paint than they do. We will bankrupt them. If somebody tags that door, we'll paint over it again. There will be no more spray paint in the state of Mississippi before this thing's done. <coughs> so I went back to my group, uh, and, I, and this is the commitment that uh, we learned that day. And this is the commitment that Together for Hope makes every day. We are absolutely committed to being more hard-headed in doing good than anybody can be hard-headed in doing bad. And my mother's here today, and she can testify before God in this church that I am a hard-headed kid. <laughs> No amens. Uh, <laughs> we have to be more hard-headed in doing good than anybody can be hard-headed in doing bad. Who knows when Jesus is going to come back? Who knows if Jesus will ever come back? And I'm going to tell you that it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when the bridegroom finally gets there. We know he's running late. And by now, good gracious, he's very late. And that's not the point. The point is, what are we doing while Jesus delays? And Matthew is warning. He said, you better be ready. And ready means doing the right thing even when no one else is. And he's a lot more generous than Amos. But, you know, Amos is a country preacher. <laughs> Amos, your hymns and, and your hymns and worship are worthless and make my ears hurt. Your sanctuary is so pretty, but your heart is so cold. You sing and pray and preach, but you don't do justice. You actually don't do anything. That country preacher wouldn't play around. Because Amos and Matthew knew something to be true. They knew that if God's people weren't doing the right thing, weren't demanding justice, weren't calling for a better world, weren't making a difference, then who would be? They knew that God's only plan for the world was God's only. We are God's plan. And there is no plan B. We are the taste that the rest of the world gets for God's reign. The rules we live by, the deeds that we do, the faith that we have are all evidence that we live by a different standard. And that standard defined is defined by God's reign or the kingdom of God. So as we close this morning, What are those characteristics? What's in, what's in that extra?
extra oil. So I'm going to ask you to do an exercise with me. Find a pen and paper if you can. And in a, in a moment of silent contemplation, just you, your pen, your paper, I want you to jot down about five characteristics that define the kingdom of God for you. When you think about God's reign, if God could have God's way right now on earth as it is in heaven, what would that look like? Just jot about five things down.
Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to this portion of the service where we give to God for the church and its mission. I'm reminded of a quote that I came across uh, this week. It says, as organizers, we are builders in an era of collapse. May this offering this morning be our lot making with builders. with fun 
as they wait. And give them twofold oil for their lamps when it feels like things are taking longer than they imagine. Thank you for Joel's leadership during this interim period. Bless his travel this weekend and his time with the church. May it be a joy to him and to the church as they move through this interim moment. For those who are suffering with illness and carrying the grief of loss, in your mercy, give them a glimpse of your goodness, Lord of life and love. Let them feel the cool breeze of your spirit swirl through their soul. Grant them firm conviction that you are, in fact, present with them now, as you've always been, and that, that the illness and grief they feel now is not due to your absence, but that you are very present in that illness and grief even now, with calm and confident assurance. Comfort them. And help us help each other. Make our fellowship not an added comfort to the worries of life, but a sustaining comfort. Show us how to love each other. And let that love permeate from this place to all other places. Let that love flow out of our doors and pour lavishly onto the streets of Jackson, Mississippi. Let our love for you and each other become a reality for our neighbors throughout our city and throughout our state so that we can all pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day
pastor of the Riverside Church in New York City. William Sloan Coffin wrote this benediction, and it's absolutely one of my favorites. Uh, but let me say thank you for letting me be with you this morning. It is a, it is a pleasure to be here. So may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you grace not to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May God take your hands, take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Amen. Amen.